that's why I feel very grateful for my dad. You're not doing a bloody accountant and bloody sure. medical. What are you doing? Can were, I, were you a bad kid? Every time I go to Heathrow, it's like a school reunion. Bro. <laughs> Swear to God, bro. Awesome. Hello. You look really regal right now. I love it. The yellow chair. I kind of look like a Primark Tony Soprano. You know I mean? We kind of totally planned this whole color coordination. By, by I the way. didn't. No, I didn't. It was just I woke up like this, baby. No, it was just yeah, just silk. I'm quite into silk shirts. Being a bit of a girthy boy, <laughs> I like to feel comfortable in the summer, and I'm embracing my kind of hairiness now. You know what I mean? Just have a few. And I'm getting a few little white hairs on the chest now, which Dude, I quite that's, like. That's I'm a, a moment, big boy though. now. I'm actually jealous. I'm looking forward to the silver fox. It's not, yeah, it's not. Well, I say silver kind of whale more for me, <laughs> but similar vibes. Yeah. I do miss a long hair. I miss it too. I actually cho I chopped it off during the first lockdown. Um, obviously, I, it was one of those things where I always thought, oh, wouldn't it be jokes if Chibadi G had a ponytail? <laughs> and then not knowing that that would be my life for like the next three, four years. <laughs> and I'm, I shouldn't have a ponytail. I don't have, the, you've seen the hairline. It goes way back. No, no, <laughs> this, this looks better. It's the Illuminati hairline. It's the McDonald's one. <laughs> um, so I shouldn't have long. I, don't, I mean, I wish I had a barnet like that. Bro, but I, it was a struggle. Jeep, it was God, a struggle ponytail. It. it was like, yeah. I called it the rat tail. But yeah, I chopped it off during lockdown and um, put it in a, a case, an art case with oh a Buddy G art, signed it and no then auctioned way. it off uh, for charity. And some lovely weirdo bought it for 13 grand. Wait, are you seeing me actually? My actual serious? rat tail with not, dandruff in it as well. It's not a joke. Not a joke. Google it. It's there. Hold on. 13 it? grand. <laughs> I'm actually going to Google this. The, my ponytail right stuck in a frame, dandruff, grease, everything, flipping ghee on it. I don't know what was on it. <laughs> <laughs> Chibuddy G, G ponytail auction price and it was during lockdown you know, it was the whole raising money for the NHS and all that and I thought lockdown we're not going to be working so I thought this is the perfect time to lock off you know Chibuddy G's ponytail raises 12 and a half thousand for the uh, NHS 13 I lied a little bit <laughs> that is that is phenomenal that's yeah, incredible yeah, yeah. yeah so that's gone but awesome so where does the journey begin let's start there like for you what are the most earliest memories of your life? Um, West London, Hounslow. Uh, Daddy was a hustler. Um, right next to Heathrow. So Hounslow is a very, if you guys are aware of Hounslow, it's right next to Heathrow. It's a very big immigrant town. And it's kind of that thing of like, you know, one stop from Heathrow. So it's kind of like, you know, the immigrants were so fucking lazy. They were like, oh, we'll just stay here. <laughs> Hounslow's fine. And they just, it's so, it's, it's a beautifully mixed place. A lot of Asians. <laughs> A lot of Somalians, Filipinos. I mean, name it, we got it. Hounslow is one of the most diverse. Still, I would say predominantly Asian, but growing up, it was a, a strange thing. Like, like I, you know, I made that joke about a kind of Primark Tony Soprano. You know, they say you grow into your, you become your parents as you get older. I am now becoming that because that's what basically what my dad was. My dad was like a kind of low level Tony Soprano around the ends. Everyone knew him. So every time we'd walk down the high street, mm. it would take, you know, 45 minutes. Because every time, Jodri Saab, Assalamu Alaikum, chatting to everyone, so much respect. He owned a, a, a Indian takeaway, all on one parade, a cab office and an internet cafe, right? Uh, you know, like a phone booth, internet cafe, all in one, like one little parade in Hounslow. So he was the Don. He, drew, he drove a red Mercedes, lowered leather interior. He had a car phone, which was hilarious because... He, he, and he used to proper flex with it. He used to be like, ah, oh, so I'm going to go. But he, you know, with the car phones, you could only call other people with car phones. So he would just call his one friend Bilal all the time. Just like, ah, oh, Bilal, Gala, what's happening? That was it. So it was a strange childhood where sometimes, you know, I say we did grow up in quite a working class environment, but it was a very um, rocky childhood where, like, one week my mum would have a fur coat um, and would have a new TV just out of nowhere. Next week, loan shark, you know what I mean? Knocking on the door. So it was very up and down. And I never really knew what my dad did. I knew that he had a few shops, and but I didn't know, you know, yeah. that he was dodgy, you know. But like, while. what was the beginning of their journey? They, they came here as, as immigrants, did they? Or? My, um, my grand, I mean, it kind of, my dad came here in his early 20s. Mm. And my mom was born here. But she, she's got an amazing story, actually. She's from Ealing, council estate girl. And uh, my grandmother... She came to England in the 60s, right, in Ealing. And her husband, my granddad, he um, said, look, I can't afford to keep you right now. He was like, go back to Pakistan. When I've got money and a good job, I'll send for you, right? Mm. Very standard thing yeah, people yeah, did yeah. in the 60s. Um, 
she went back to Pakistan with my mom, who was born in England, then went to Pakistan. Three, four years later, she can't get a hold of him. She doesn't know where he is, right? Doesn't know where, she, like, so she comes to England in like the mid 60s. Oh my and God. my grace told me an amazing story where she was so paranoid about not getting in that she dressed up as some of those 60s girls and put that, the, all that, you know, the pastel makeup <laughs> they had and all this. And I've actually got pictures of that. Um, and then she went looking for her husband. When she found him, she found out that he was remarried to two other women. Oh my God. Two kids, yeah. So it was a very rocky kind of beginning. And then from there, my grandmother was like, didn't trust anyone. And you know, of course, of who course. would you trust? Council state raised my, and then my mom married my dad. And um, yeah, they had me and my, my mom had me and my sister both before the age of 20. So they were young, like young, young mm. parents. But um, your, your father's entrepreneurial spirit, like kind of where did that come from? Like he he he, he had he, some capital to kind of work with to kind of create these businesses or was like literally just hustle from the ground up. He, he was, I'd say what he has and it's what, I, what I'm very grateful that he's given to me is, you know, I think a lot of being successful in anything mm. is first of all, you just need to get people to like you. If you're likable and it's effortless, it's around, I'd say around 50% of the job is done. You know, because if someone likes you, you're kind of, you know, you're already in there. And he's got that ability to like, if he was in this room right now, he would be chirping all the girl in here. They'd, he would charm the pants. He'll be best mates with all these boys here. They'd yeah, be yeah. taking numbers. Oh, oh, yeah, very good. Oh, yeah, I've got this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hustling, bruv. Like, yeah. and you wouldn't even know it, but he's scamming you. You wouldn't even know it. But like, <laughs> no, but in a nice way, like he's looking to see what can I get from this person. Always thinking, always thinking. He's got that kind of, but in a kind of like kind of tran transactional way, or kind of like both. It's okay. a kind of a hustlers, immigrant hustling kind of way, mm -hmm. and also a transactional way. You know, so it's and that's why put him anyway. He'll make money because he knows how to. If you know how to, if you if you're likable, you know how to speak with people. You can make money. So mm -hmm. you know, I I kind of joke about it, and of course, like you know, Chibadi G is based a lot on my dad, and I'd say a lot of the good stuff is based on my dad. That eternal optimist. Never, and my dad's had so many businesses, you would not believe. Like, he's always got a new business popping off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, for example, and he always, it always fails, always fails. So he's the eternal optimist where he will try, he will fail, but he won't give up. He'll try again. Mm -hmm. And that spirit is what Chibadi G has. Mm -hmm. That's why Chibadi G was, you know, start his own, you know, D&G, Deepak and Gurdave. He'll start <laughs> his champagne steam. It was all the stupid little scams he does. Um, and that is, that's why I feel very grateful for my dad, because even though I speak about it in a way which is funny and maybe, yeah, yeah. you know, being like, there's, there's also trauma, there's also pain there, you know, it's also a dodgy way to live. I wouldn't recommend it yeah, to yeah. anyone, but hugely inspirational as well in terms of character. You know, if you grew up with that man, yeah. everything from the way he do, way he has this amazing thing that's a, become a Chibadi G catchphrase is that he, we know every Asian person has their posh white voice. So when he chats to people, he goes, um, Hello. <laughs> it's just like, what is that? Is and that where you got? Is that where you got it from the show? Oh my god! My, my dad goes, "Hello," and it's so amazing. So I mean, infinite influence and inspiration yeah, for yeah. me. I mean, like I, I grew up with a very similar father. Actually, my father was very dynamic. Always the one making like. My dad would enter the room and you knew he entered the room. Yeah. He was like joking around and, like you said, very lovable, charming, all those things. But um, growing up with a father like that was amazing also because you kind of benefited from being in the slipstream of that kind of magnetism. You learn, right? You watch him and you learn. Right, but it can also be really like, some people might find it quite anchoring, right? Mm -hmm. To be around such a gravitational magnetic personality all the time. Where did you ever feel like you couldn't kind of live up to that same, like for example, I'll give you a very real example. My father had this really charming African accent. Right. Right? And as much as I tried to be equally dynamic and magnetic, there was something very African about his charm mm -hmm. that I could never replicate because it was never part of my experience. I, my accent's very British, mm -hmm. but there was something really Kenyan about the way that he would like swindle people or joke around or flirt mm -hmm. with someone. And I could never quite get that. Did you ever feel like you were kind of competing with your father? I, you know what? It's, it's a strange thing, but I never really did feel that. I, feel, I always felt quite proud that that's my dad and I never felt embarrassed by him and always, I'm always very like if he walked in right now I'd be happy and proud I'd be like you lot wait till you meet my dad we should have so it was time. sorry funny that you said that we've got a special guest tonight <laughs> <and> daddy <laughs> <laughs> sorry uh, no it, it, I, I never actually felt that that's a re really great question but there's also something that I was speaking to my therapist about the other day, uh, yeah. which, you know, yes, I have therapy. We should all have it if you can afford it. Yeah. And she was talking about the changing of the guard, right? Where something happened the other day where it was my little sister's birthday, her 14th. And, and me and my fiance, we hosted it in our house. It's a new house. 
my dad came, my you know, uncles, my cousins. I mean, a lot of people haven't seen each other for a while. And I remember I was doing something where I hadn't, I'm a video camera nerd, right? Like, cause mm. before I did acting and all that, I was, I studied film and film and broadcast and media. So I love lenses and cameras. Mm. So I had my big boy camera and I'm walking around the house filming everyone and zooming in and making it. I made a lovely little kind of documentary off the wall thing for the birthday and I sent it to all my family and they loved it. And I, and I remember my fiance said, she was like, you were being dad. You were proper being dad, dad vibes. And I was like, yeah, I was. And then I was watching the video back and I, I watched my dad in the video back and I could see he looked a bit, ups not sad, he looked a bit sad because he used to do that. Mm. He was the one who used to do that at our family gatherings. And I didn't even notice it. And then I spoke to my therapist man and she said, it's the changing of the guard. It's that thing of like, now you're the kind of the provider. People look to you. And I don't want that responsibility. Mm. Like, you know, my little, he's got, you know, but my parents are divorced, different kids and that. But there was this changing of the guard, which felt kind of, sad yeah, but yeah, also sad. like weird right little symbolic thing of just filming because that's what dad does right so that was interesting but we have a great relationship now and uh he actually the, the funny thing about chabadi g is that you know he is i mean he is like a real life chabadi g but he doesn't understand why chabadi g is a loser he's like he's a very smart guy <laughs> <laughs> very entrepreneurial you know all this stuff so no, I, I love my dad he was a great great you know he is a great guy and um yeah like i said so much inspiration from a character yeah, yeah. like that it's endless funny. you know yeah it's funny i think especially in man's relation with the father i i totally relate with that passing of the god kind of energy i think a lot of people do even like some people here with a lot of men with their fathers and i think like especially with my dad it was just kind of it was a weird kind of like it, it wasn't vindictive or like venomous mm -hmm. but it was a weird I, I, at times it felt competitive I think that's very natural though, in terms of, I think it's very animal. You yeah, know what I mean? It's that exactly. kind of, the paternal kind of, you know, um, and that that kind of, the, the patriarchy, sorry, is, you yeah, know, yeah, it's yeah. that the man, the alpha, who's the, who's the leader of the pack. But like he wanted me to win. Yeah, they But do. it was kind of like, he but, just wants to also put me in my place. Yeah, he, like, wants, he wants you to win, but like know. you're not. As yeah, as I, he wants you to know that don't try it, bro. I'm still your dad. <laughs> my dad's tiny, I'll batter him. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll check it out. But there, there, is, a, there is a thing of like, um, you know, like that. You know, the, 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 the sudden this this bit of responsibility comes onto you, like a role reversal with your parents, which 100%. I find now, like as a grown man, I find that I'm doing a lot of the stuff that they used to do for me. You know, where I'm telling them, "Oh my God, what are you doing?" Mm. or giving them advice or helping out in you know whatever ways, you know, emotionally, financially, whatever. Mm. Like, and it's it, it's got that thing where I was watching that film June the other day, right? Mm. I, I liked. It. I know a lot of people don't like it. It's June, got really June. Yeah, June. Oh, okay. And it's got a really cheesy quote in it where it says. Um, uh, leaders don't want to lead, they answer the call to lead. Mm. And it's like, I don't want to lead. I don't want to, you know, I don't want that responsibility. But sometimes you've got to answer that call when it comes to your family and that yeah. that dynamic. And it, it, it's strange because it, it comes up quick on you and you're like, oh shit, no, I'm the one in charge. Like, not in charge, but people are looking at me now, you know? Yo, I, yeah, and it's it's scary because you're like, I don't want to fuck this up. And you know. 100%, I felt that, I felt that really actually, it's, it's, I felt that very recently. Obviously my father passed away recently and that was a huge formative moment in my life. And I remember when I first had to lead the prayer in my house. Wow. And for me, that was a real like, That's oh. That's big. Because like, I had my sister and my mother behind me. And I remember being like, this was always an automatic process where your dad just naturally goes in and he does that. And it was a comfort in that leadership, right? Mm -hmm spiritually as well which is a very intimate relationship but like someone guides you through that process but it was the first time where i was like wow like this is me now like this is i have to be this person and like you said i did not want to be that person you answered the call but i was angry though a bit part of me was yeah, angry yeah, that i had same, to be that person same because you're like this is your job yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not my job and i felt a bit resentful about the whole situation in that yeah. moment because i felt like i wanted to follow and i enjoyed following and yep. it, whether it was you know other formative family moments knowing that you have to suddenly take a bit more directive initiative. Mm -hmm. There was a bitterness there in my heart about that a little bit. But what I wanted to circle back with the father, which is really interesting, obviously he provided a lot of subconscious inspiration for mm -hmm. characters that you play in your future, et cetera. But did he support your creative endeavors when you were thinking about doing media? And, and No, my mom and my dad did not get it. I was, uh, as a child, I was that kind of annoying little fat kid who would like, grab the mic and you know like start yeah. rapping and like dog doing moonwalking around the house and then like playing pranks as well i remember once i, I played a <laughs> prank i used to play pranks all the time like really bad pranks as well like mom there's a pedo outside and shit like that like really like not funny <laughs> if i think back really bad things like calling up the police and saying oh my neighbor's got a gun all that shit and the police would come like really little shit 
So my my mum and dad were a little bit like fucking hell. <laughs> and I remember once actually, proper boy who cried wolf. There was this rusty nail in my garden, yeah. And I was outside playing football, you know. What I mean, being you know probably trying to get some attention. Yeah. And the rusty nail went right in my foot, Oof. like right in the ball of my foot. And I went in running, like that. And she was going, "Shut up, you idiot." <laughs> literally leaking blood from my foot she's like where do you get that one where do you get the fake blood from like so it was i was a kind of annoying kid but the thing i and I, the, here's the funny thing about my parents and i'm not being bitter and resentful because i go back and i realize again with my therapist they were fucking children yeah no, no they weren't fucking children they were children yeah. sorry <laughs> should, should I have, that was a weirdly you know what i mean you know what i mean punctuation yeah, yeah, punctuation, punctuation is very right. important all right <laughs> <laughs> um, they were children themselves. They were, I mean, imagine being in your early 20s and having a mortgage and two kids. Fuck that. I was a complete piece of shit at that age. Early 20s, I was a moron. You know what I mean? They had this four. So I, I think I was doing a lot of creative things around the house. I was making little music videos. I remember I used to wait for like the Michael Jackson videos and edit when he would spin around and wait on the box and MTV and press play and pause on the VCR and make a clip, basically the original TikTok I used to do mm. and just do a long compilation of him spinning in all his different videos, shit like that. And I show my mom and she's like, what are you doing? You know, or um, making music. You know, I used to have hip hop EJ, get all my boys around, write their raps. We had a whole rap crew. We used to make music videos. We used to do mad shit. And I'm looking back now, if that was my son doing that at those that making album covers, that's amazing, the creativity, but it was seen as you're messing around Stop, because my grades were bad. You know what I mean? Because I wasn't concentrating in school, but I was being fully creative. Mm -hmm. So I think kids learn in different ways. And even when we were doing early people just do nothing stuff, when I said I wanted to do media and all that, they were going, what's media? What's that? Fair play to them. Back then it wasn't seen as a proper career. You know, if you're not doing a bloody accountant and bloody sure. medical, what are you doing? You know, and they thought, oh, you know, Arsene's going to be a, you know, whatever, he'll be a car salesman or some bullshit. Did they have expectations of you? None. None at all, and and I, and I look back and were, I, were you a bad kid? But was I what a bad kid? No, I was a cheeky little oh. fat boy, cheeky fat, cute cheeky fat boy, lovable, f lovable little fat, fat little fat boy. <laughs> you know what you know what I mean? Those little cheeky chubby cheek running around, little bean stains on their tops. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cute, cute, like harmless. You know, very loved, like just a very happy guy. I made everyone. I, used to, I wanted to make everyone laugh all the time. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. always funny as a kid. You know what I mean? Because my my parents were funny, but that pressure again. Speaking with my therapist. She said that lack of um, expectation actually helped me because I was just allowed to do whatever the fuck I wanted to do. Interesting. I had full freedom and obviously being a Pakistani Muslim family, complete opposite of what my sister had, who was a year older than me. She had the pressure. She was academically brilliant. She was all this. She had all this pressure on her. She was the golden child. Mm. And I was the kind of like, you know, discarded kind of like, oh, don't worry about him. They weren't worried about me. They weren't be. they were just like, he'll just do what he needs to. There's a saying actually, in, which I've coined, <laughs> from Hounslow, which is very true. If you're from Hounslow, there's only two ways out of Hounslow, right? You either work in the family business or you work at Heathrow. <laughs> that is fucking 100% true. I swear to God, I must have around 30 to 40 friends who every time I go to Heathrow, it's like a school reunion, bro. <laughs> swear to God, bro. <laughs> oh, Tim, what are you saying? Bro? I've only seen you on the TV now, you little cunt. Like, oh, sorry. But you know what I mean? <laughs> school reunion like it's and it's and i look at them and i think yeah bro that could have been me and listen it, i'm not knocking it some of them have been at heathrow for a long time their dads were at heathrow their granddads it's right. institutional like it's bare mm. nepotism in heathrow like and they're always the worst ones as well when i'm at immigration yeah, what is it about the brown on brown violence yeah, no, every brother. time i'm trying to come back home they, they're the ones giving me issues they hate on you. that's what it is because they didn't want to work at heathrow they that's what i mean so there was only two ways out of Hounslow. it was family business which a lot of my boys do or heathrow so I was going to fall into one of those things. And when I started, when I got my camera and I started filming, you know, little comedy sketches and music videos, even then my mum was going, you need to get a job. Like, this is not, this is bullshit. You know, and uploading on YouTube early days, you know, 2008, 2009, when YouTube wasn't seen as what it is now. Like, you know, now it's like, there's no excuses. Like, YouTube is there. You put your shit out, TikTok is ever YouTube mm. back then. It wasn't like, it was basically like oh, the funny cat video. You know, it was that, you know, have you seen that video? It wasn't like a, we can actually upload and tell our story. Here, but that's know? what I want to know. Like, so, so your parents didn't actively encourage you. No. So what was like the driving, co compelling, creative force in your life as a teen? Like what, what made you be like, yeah, I want to like do the hip hop thing. Because music was the first frontier, right? Yeah. So like, yeah, what inspired you to do that? Like what, what references were there? What, what I have is I have this thing in me, which... 
I'm very grateful that I have it is that I um, I have this burning kind of urge or desire inside of me to create stuff and just always create. I'm always, I love creating stuff. I love, I love kind of, yeah, I love creating stuff. And But what, what I do is that when I'm done with something, like say if I've written a script and let's say I've shot the film or shot the show, when that, once that's out, once, once it's out and I've delivered it and it's out, I don't, I really couldn't give a shit about it because it's not, it's not mine anymore, right? Mm. So like you create this baby of yours and this is, then it's out, it's yours now, it's not mine. Yeah. And what's kept me creating is that instantly then, and there's also a mourning, there's also, you also mourn a, a creation that you make, you know, it's like a child, you raise this child and then it's gone. Mm. It doesn't need you anymore, it's everyone else's, everyone else has got memories now and catchphrases and oh, that, you know, people come up to me and they tell me, their favorite people just nothing moments or we saw you in the BA ad or whatever Black Mirror. And I'm like, I don't, that's not mine anymore. That's mm -hmm. yours. So there's a, a great mourning. It's a sense of, you know, loss. Um, and there's a sense of detachment. So then what I do is we have to make another one. Just keep on making what's next, what's next. And I know you're like that as well with your content. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, at your rate as well. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, you, 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 I mean, you can be proud of your work and be like, yeah, I was proud of that, mm -hmm. but it's done, it's finished. Next I think a lot thing. of people dwell on the past and what they've right. done and all what they haven't done and what they've achieved, what they haven't achieved. Like if you're just progressively kind of moving forward and being like, what's next, what's next, sure. what's next? That burning, but that's easier said than done. I think a lot of people, I, I think it's a rare thing for people to have that burning design. You know, my, my fiance doesn't, my sister doesn't have it. Yeah. My cousins, my friends, they they go to me like, what the fuck, how'd you, mm. you know? And, and I don't know, I'll be honest with you. A lot of it maybe is that kind of proving people wrong as well. Like, you know, like the people who doubted me back in the day, um, you know, I did drama GCSE, right? I, I, I've told this story before, but I think it's important because I think the the importance of a good teacher and the importance of a bad teacher is something that I always talk about. In 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 my drama school, in my drama lesson, I did drama GCSE, and I, again, I was naughty. You know, I mean, I was always high. I was I was blazed out every lesson, but I was good, obviously. You know, I mean, I was creative. I was expressive. You know, and um, I my mate yeah, Nix, he threw a rubber at the teacher's head right? She turned around, she saw me and she hated me. You know, just a teacher, like you could cough and you get detention. It was mm. that level. And she went, and she proper milked it. She was going, oh, <laughs> like she'd been shot. Oh my God, I've never in my life, ask him, get here now. Give me your, you're going to pay for this. And I was going, fuck it. Obviously I'm not going to snitch on my boy. I didn't even throw it. You know what I mean? But I didn't snitch. So she kicked me out of the class. It's GCSE as well. And she said, all right, you need to earn your grade back. You need to come in early. You need to do this. You need to do that. So I came in early. I worked really hard. I wrote my group's final play, which was a which was a my version of The Godfather. It was called The Poppadom Father. <laughs> very good, very very good. I, you know, and I gave myself a tiny little role because I thought I might not. I was a cleaner, and then she and then she still didn't grade me. She still graded me a U. And my whole crew, my whole team, wrote a letter to her saying, "Please, can you grade him?" And then because of that, that that woman it knocked my confidence so much that I didn't do any acting for the next maybe five, six years. Mm. I completely thought, what's the point? You know, I'm not gonna... So I went behind the scenes and I started doing media studies and film and writing and all that until I accidentally started doing Chibuddy again. But that she stayed with me. That knocked my confidence. And maybe that that drive, you know, when someone does do you wrong and it's not like a, uh, a victim mentality. She did me dirty. Like she actually did me... And it, it, I proved myself. She sent me a challenge. Fair enough, I was a dick. She sent me a challenge, I met that challenge and she still didn't do it. So I felt this great injustice. Yeah. And maybe I still feel that injustice now in, in everything I do. So I still have a point to prove, which I think is important because you need that. I think you need, you need haters. You need resistance, right? You to need push back haters. Yeah. You gotta pull, you gotta pull a bow back for it to fling forward, right? Exactly. So something has to take exactly. you. But, but what's interesting about that time, I mean, like you're slightly older than me, but like at that time, I never felt like I mean, if I could do my life again, I would one hundred percent be an actor. I would have loved to have done that. I'd like, enjoyed performance. Been a He's bloody gorgeous as well. <laughs> should have been the leading man. Yeah, you should have, man. Not too <laughs> late. Appreciate bro. that. Come on. Appreciate that. Kind of a like, brown Hugh Grant vibe. Like, I'm come getting. on, stop. Come that. on, yeah, I did bloody gorgeous, eh? Sorry, I, I, sexy. I, I didn't hear that. Say it one more time. Say it one more time. My, <laughs> The mic, something wrong with the. <laughs> Do you catch that, Moe? You got that? Cool. That's the um, sound bite. No, so so for me, there were no references, right? For me, there were. Can I just no say something? One thing. Go sorry. Ahead. My fiance, she was looking at your Instagram earlier and she was going, <laughs> he's bloody gorgeous. And she was going, you better look good. You're going to look like an absolute potato in front of me. <laughs> for fuck's sake. Cheers. Which she was right, to be fair. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, what's her name? 
Savan, she's uh, Savan. Armenian. I'll be sending her a message later. Yeah, we basically look like um, <laughs> DJ Khaled and Kim K together. <laughs> Seriously, go on my Instagram. <laughs> Oh, I appreciate it. No, what I'm trying to say <laughs> Sorry, is... Sorry, go on. No, no, go ahead. No, no, go Compliment on. me all you want, bro. Don't never apologize for the compliments. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, for me, there were never any references that made me feel comfortable enough that I could support a livelihood for me and myself and my family, but also thrive in a kind of actor industry. But for you, it would have been even worse. Like, what were the, what were the creative influences that made you feel like, oh, man, this is what I want to do? Or, you know, because, um, you know... The representation would have limited yeah. wouldn't have much there so what what drove you to be like i can do this i can do this you know it's funny you know the sister was saying earlier about the white dude complaining that he couldn't get any roles like that you know that shit is real like that does happen they you know especially nowadays when they're like oh it's all just fucking box ticking in it you know mm. what i mean you need a jamaican surname or muslim and all that um but look i can't play james bond I can't be, you know what I mean? Like, I can't, I mean, I, actually, maybe I could. I like, you could be James Bond. <laughs> no, no, no. You think, could be James Bond. I think Bond. James Bond needs to arrive at diversity point where you can play James Bond. Yeah, he should. Yeah. No, it's not the Asian thing. <laughs> we need I'm more just not broad perspectives of what James Bond broad is. Broad is the word you're looking for. <laughs> girthy, Very girthy, broad. Girthy. Very girthy. Yeah, girthy Bond. I'm ready for that. Um, no, growing up, definitely goodness gracious me. Huge, huge inspiration, and and man, listen. Some things you manifest. Uh, so I don't know why I said listen like that. You know when people say that, it really annoys me. Listen, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> sports commentators quiet. say Everyone's as quiet. well. Shh, listen, listen, listen. listen. Like, why am I saying that? Good, weird. <laughs> Sorry, um, Sanjeev Baskar. Uh, yeah. You manifest some things. I grew up literally watching him, recording him on VHS, mm. watching Goodness Gracious Me, studying it, representation. Also laughing at the white man, flipping it. Because people think, and this is one point I'd like to make. Obviously, there's a lot of um, of us brown and black you know, people in here, you know, a lot of ethnic people, which I love. And we do get that, like you were saying, the stereotype thing of, oh, all your jokes about being brown and all that. But like, it's there's a very different thing, right? Which goodness gracious me did. Like, what's the joke on? It's what Dave Chappelle used to speak about. What are the people actually laughing at? Mm. Do you know what I mean? And he started feeling uncomfortable about what people are laughing at, right? right? And there's definitely that. There was that element of goodness gracious to me. Where you, I'm sure you had a lot of white people watching it going, ha, 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 cutty, and all yeah, that, yeah, laughing yeah, at exactly. the axes, oh, you yeah, know, yeah. and all that. But really, they were so well observed and they were so texturized and... You know, I can make it at home for nothing. Remember that? Everyone has an auntie who goes to a restaurant saying, how much is this? Are at home I make it? That's a real person, hmm. right? That's um, Indian. That's a real person. Remember, everything was, where do you get this? This is Indian. Mm, oh, that's yeah. a real person. Yeah. Um, and, and then I bring it to, you know, Chibadi. I've had questions, of course. Are you perpetuating a stereotype? And I would say, man, listen, Chibadi G is as real as they come. Not only is he a real three-dimensional character he is regionally specific if you go to Hounslow you will hear people speaking exactly like Chibadi G mm. and the other thing about Chibadi G is that his okay fair enough he has a freshy accent yeah it makes him funny we know that the V's and W's of course another observation which is real right even the way he says Hale, all that shit real right from based on real people but let's just say Del Boy Chibadi G is basically Del Boy right he's a uh, he's a modern day Del Boy Chibadi G could be black Chibadi G could be white, Chibadi G could be Chinese. Doesn't matter, Chibadi G could be Arab. Because what makes a character funny, and this goes to any character creation, if you think that what makes him funny is a few little funny accents and a little dance or whatever, you don't have a character, you have a meme, mm -hmm. right? You have a, a 10 second TikTok. It's not a real thing. You need to think about the, the core things of what makes people funny, delusion. You know what I mean? That kind of overly overly confident right. you know that eternal optimist never giving up like these are fight. he thinks he's a ladies man you know the his fashion sense these things are like character traits that people they're not you know ethnically specific they can be anything so and goodness gracious me did that yeah. and um but on, the, on that like I, I remember like i think it was 2020 20, or 2020 20. yeah that's way in the future. <laughs> twenty twenty, there was a an article written, and someone challenged you actually about the character of Chibadi G, basically mm -hmm. saying how like, do you feel that like Chibadi G was perpetuating a certain stereotype about the community? Do you feel like you are part of a problem where like people are laughing at ethnic minorities as opposed to like laughing with them, they're laughing at them? And mm -hmm. um, I guess you kind of answered that, but like you know, do you feel like you have a responsibility to accept how your characters are? taken in a no, no, no i don't have responsibility anyone could take a character any way they like and of course it's about intelligence as well mm. you know if someone understands a character and, and the thing is everyone knows the chibadi g 
everyone knows a Chibadi mm. G. He's relatable. So it's not, uh, you know, st stereotypes are normally not really that real people. They're kind of caricatures and things you see that are very overblown, yeah. you know what I mean? But everyone knows a real Chibadi G. So um, yeah, in a way, I think I have a responsibility for re representation, but also, you know, the, I mean, I think we all have a, 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 you know, a thing to tell our story. And my, my story of Chibadi G is very personal to me. Like mm. I said, it's based on my dad, it's based on my friends, it's based on my uncles. He's from the hometown I was raised, born and raised in. It's a very close thing to my heart, you know, it's not, yeah. I have great love for Chibadi G, you know, and I, and I treat him with love and respect. I don't just treat him as this kind of like stereotypical, I don't want to enforce any stereotypes. I want to represent with this great character who's loved and, um, I'm very proud of his creation, you know, and, yeah, and I'm yeah. ready for any questions. I think you have to be ready as well. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to do something like that, you need to be ready to answer those questions and answer yeah. it in an articulate way, which is going to help the next generation mm -hmm. as well, which is what we're doing now. And it's about, like I was talking about Sanjeev Bhaskar, you know, it's about a situation where you get to where it's good to put people on a pedestal and be like, you know, like Mim knows, yeah, you've worked with a lot of great actors. We've been in movies together and you see these people. It's good to put them on that pedestal at a time, but also there's a moment, and this goes for any industry, is comes a moment where, and this might sound a little bit kind of DJ Khaled vibes, but there, there comes a moment where your, your idols become your rivals. Mm. So, and that hit me a few years ago when I was going, I've been doing this comedy shit for like 11, 12 years now. You know what I mean? A couple of BAFTAs, blah, blah, blah. Nice awards, recognition people's little brothers watching us, their dads going, I remember when I used to watch you in school and we're going, fucking hell, we're old. But I remember I was nominated for a couple of BAFTAs alongside some legends. Like I'm talking Steve Coogan, Harry Enfield, um, uh, P Peter Kay, right? David Mitchell. Like, yeah, these are big boy comedy legends, right? I didn't win, but don't watch that. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and I remember Harry Enfield actually sent me a funny video when I was nominated for him. He sent me this video and it was going, this, these, that's Asim Chowdhury, typical. Coming over here, nicking our BAFTAs. <laughs> and it was, it, 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 it just, I think you have to take stock. And then Sanjeev Bhaskar, I'm now playing alongside him in the in this new uh, Netflix show, Sandman. We're playing Cain and Abel, brothers, ah, right? So it, it, it's that pinch yourself moment. But it's also like, believe it. Like, be yeah, like, 100%. yeah, we watch these people. We love these people. We learn from these people. But I want to get to you one day. Yeah, and yeah. maybe one day surpass you. Why not? You know, have that ability. Because I do think in sometimes in our culture, we do idolize people like, oh, listen, they, they have that same story, the same struggle. Mm -hmm. You can get there. You know, it's, it's that self-belief. Obviously, you need a bit of delusion as well. Yeah, yeah. People say delusion is a bad thing. Sometimes you need it. I remember telling people with the shit I wanted to do back in the day. They were just like, Pfft. yeah, sure, mate. You know what I mean? Oh, man, there's so much I want to pick on that. Yeah, there was yeah. one video I saw of you walking past Wiley. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. And like, like jump off back in the day. Yeah, that I was, was my rap again. battle days. I think, did you know that was Wiley in front of you? No, I didn't know. I didn't clock. I think that was a funny. And was he something? I think I heard say, him say something anti Semitic. That's when I realized it was him. No no way. <laughs> he said something about Jews running the world. And I was like, oh, yes, Wiley. Yeah. <laughs> so Wiley. Um, another thing, taking two steps back, you, you talked about putting work out there and Chibadi G being read in a certain way. And a lot of us are creators here and a lot of us are putting work in the public sphere. And a lot of the anxiety and the stress that comes with it is being like, you can't control the narrative that people shape around your creation. No. It doesn't matter whether it's graphic images, it doesn't matter where it's acting, it doesn't matter whether it's comedy. Like, did you, you know, a lot of us get emotionally triggered as well when people read it in a way that we don't put it out there because weirdly, we're all creating with an intention to benefit people, to entertain or to inform. But when people read it differently, it hurts. Do yeah. you, especially with your experiences in, you know, not just Chabadi, but I guess Chabadi is a perfect reference, but did it ever jar you? Was there a moment or you felt like really frustrated that the industry was not seeing the character in the way that you wanted it to be perceived? Not the industry. I don't think it was industry. Or, or the people. That what I would for. say, though, it's a sticky one here, right? Let's talk about accents. Let's talk about how, you know, I can do a ragazzi, uh, cappuccino. You know, I, can, I can do that. But it's not, no one's, no one's gasping, are they? Um, but when a white person does an Indian accent, still to this day, it's like, ooh, you know, that's, is that racist? Mm. And obviously me having a character who speaks with a Pakistani London accent, uh, I do get white people coming up to me and being, and I'm going, fucking hell, what are you doing, <laughs> bruv, stop. <laughs> and that can be annoying, but here's my thing. And I've said this before and I stand by it, right? No accent is racist if you do it well. <laughs> no accent in the world can be racist if you go up to that person you do it well to their face 
Yeah, and I've had that before. I've had white boys come up to me who do a better Chibadi G accent than me, right? And it's pure love. You know why? Shall I tell you why? Because that shows me a few things. It shows me a level of respect that they've watched me to a point where they've mastered my fucking voice. Mm. They've mastered my mannerisms. They've mastered, well, not mine, Chibadis. They've mastered the words, the lingo, you know, mm. and you, you get that. You know, people can do great Alan Partridge uh, impressions. People can do great, I don't know, you know, just name it. Name a Del Boy impressions. Mm. It shows a level of respect and care. And that can go with any accent. So that's mm. my thing. If you're going to do an accent, especially to the person who has that accent, do it well and it will never be racist. Do you like, do, do you like white Caucasians who love people just do nothing and your character, Shabadi G, do they view your character differently than an Asian from East London, Bethnal Green? It's so It's a great question. It's, it goes back to that thing of relay, relatability. Mm. An Asian from Hounslow will come up and be like, brav. Spot on, bro. bro, bro. Uncle my uncle, like yeah, my yeah, uncle's yeah, the exactly, real Chabadi. Yeah, yeah. They'll take over. They'll say, "These are my uncle. That's Chabadi G, but I swear, white boys, same shit." My uncle Barry, he's a bit <laughs> no of a Chabadi G. Trust me, he's a bit of a Chabadi. You know, trust me. Like you know, it, you know, I, I got Nigerian brothers came up to me once. He was like, "My uncle, bro, he's a Chabadi <laughs> G, bro. He's a wheeler dealer, all yeah. this and that." So no, and and that's because it's a, it's a again, it goes back to what makes someone funny, what makes someone interesting, character. If you want to write characters, fuck the gender, fuck the the ethnicity, the religion. That doesn't make anyone funny. Being a man or being a woman, it doesn't make someone funny. It just Chibadi G could be a woman, right? It'd still be the same character. Yeah, we call it Chibadi G spot. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. That was a bit weird. Oh god, that was a bit weird. Cut, <laughs> cut that bit out. Um, but yeah, so put down on paper what makes something interesting, a character. Right? What are their flaws? What are they good yeah. at? What are their their neurosis? What are their you know? What are their little you know, yeah, kinks? Yeah. What what what's, what makes them interesting? And then you can add. We'll go then go. Oh, we can make him a man. I tell you what. Should we make him? Let's make him Chinese. No, no. You know what? He'll be Thai. Doesn't matter. You know. So that's something I really try and push because people normally do it the other way. We need a funny Filipino character. You know what I mean? Like we need more diversity. We need the, no, no, no. The labels you, become before the story yes, the character. Yes, and, mm. the box ticking almost comes before what, what even makes this person interest. And also look, just study real people, people watching. Who likes people watching? You know, sometimes I walk around with my headphones in, they're not on. And not, not, not even though they're not on, I have that little function where I can hear even better. You know them ones? Yeah, yeah, and I yeah. just sit in the caf sometimes. I sit in a restaurant and I just listen to people. I watch people. Yeah. Watch the way someone drinks coffee. Watch the way someone study them. does anything. Just study them. It makes people funny, man. People are funny. People do funny things. Like this woman today, I had a meeting with a woman today. Lovely woman. And uh, it was for something I'm doing. And every time, I, every time we laughed, she would she'd go, <laughs> and she would do this to me. I was like, what the fuck are you doing? Well, I thought she was flirting with me, right? It was a bit weird because she's an elder woman as well. And she was going, <laughs> What the fuck are you doing? And then she went, sorry, she goes, when I get really excited, I just kind of do that to people. And I thought, what the fuck is that about? And I, I loved it. And I, was, I jotted it down on my phone. And I was like, weird finger thing. Just yeah, remember yeah. that, you know? <laughs> you never know. Uh, actually, like, it's, it's funny because there's, there's an interesting parallel there, what you said about how, like, when someone does an accent well, it shows that they put time and mm -hmm. effort into it. It's actually the same thing about, like, when producers write characters, right? 100%. So, like, really, like, a really lame person of color character on any sitcom show you can tell when effort's been put into it or not so really it's consistent with that same thing is that yeah. like if people are putting effort into understanding the character beyond the labels then the character itself will also be equally dynamic at the same time exactly and, and i'll give you an example of um actually i won't give you because i don't want to i don't want to shame anyone but there, there have been some kind of, no no space, <laughs> there space. has There's been some there have been some sitcoms some characters which i think have gone the other way, but I actually think the intentions were right in the yeah. beginning. And then what happens is that when you enter that kind of mainstream sphere and people say, well, it kind of needs to be like this. And then it has to change and you compromise your art for it, which I think has happened a few times, you know? Um, and that is something that I think is changing now. I think now, even the mainstream people, the BBC ones and the BB, you know, the, the ITVs, they're coming to trying to find that authentic voice because they can't find it. I remember they, I remember this one, I was talking to this one exec and he was going, how do you guys, you know, capture that authentic urban voice? And I was like, because that's how we chat. Like it's not capturing anything, like it's some magic potion. Well, why can't they find it? I think like, it's always frustrating for me to hear that because I'm gonna feel like we're here. 
We're yeah. here. Exactly. We're right? here. So like, yeah. what is it negligence? Is it lack of effort? Is it rhetoric that they want to find it, but they're not really putting the effort in? Like you're, you're more clued in in the industry than anyone in this room. I think, I think they're still a bit afraid and they don't know what to do with it. Like, mm -hmm. I think it's when you capture such raw talent and real people, like it's scary for people who are just rigid and live their life in a certain way where it's like, you know, you go here and you do this and you do that. You 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 go to drama school and then you, once you finish drama school, maybe if you're a comedian, you go to Edinburgh Festival and you put a show on. There. We didn't do any of that. You know, we didn't do any of that. So the, the, the unconventional, the come up is more unconventional now. And they haven't studied it. Mm -hmm. We have because we, that's how we came up. We came up really unconventionally, YouTube. You know what I mean? And then TV and then like almost back to social media and then live shows and then sketches. And like, you know, it was very unconventional, but you're seeing that more so now. You're seeing... And you're seeing people who are just like, you can't deny them. You know, when you see some characters who are coming from YouTube or Instagram or TikTok and you look at them and you go, wow, like that is a ball of talent there where these, these TV people don't know what the fuck to do with that. But in a weird way, they don't really need the TV people anymore, mm. which I love. I love that now you can just be, you can just make peas off YouTube and get your brand deals and TikTok and Instagram. There's no excuses anymore. This is one thing I tell people. You know, people excuse me. Oh, man, I can't get my shit out there. Oh, man. Hey, everyone's hating on me, man. Oh, everyone can't get a break. Shut the fuck up. You know what I mean? You have every avenue out there. And if you are, if, you know, hard work, talent, right? I know some of the most talented people I know are waste mans from Hounslow. I swear to God. I believe you trust me but uh, that is a perfect segue because i'd love to go a few steps back and be like especially what you're talking about youtube and and that's like your entry point into the scene that you're in now mm -hmm. you obviously came into that scene with your boys yeah and like how old are you a lot uh, at that time but before i get there actually because a lot of us here are like some artists here and some creators here maybe that that moment that step or maybe it's the community they've been waiting for to really like take off mm -hmm still quite elusive to them maybe it's like at arm's reach but for me when i see you it's kind of started with this kind of formation of this friendship yep. group like what did that friendship group look like how did you encourage each other like yeah what was the beginnings of that we were basically all at college together and we were all doing music we were all music guys so we were all rappers producers and heavily into hip-hop like uk hip-hop you know rap battling and um a lot of smoking weed i'm not gonna lie a lot of smoking <laughs> weed and pranks a lot of it was pranks doing pranks watching documentaries watching bare documentary getting high and watching bare documentaries because with, with no purpose though well it was just, just enjoyment you guys well, were just no, like, no, no, people watching you know like people watching is basically watching documentaries right because it's a slice of real life it's fly on the wall you know just watching normal people live their normal lives and i mean i love documentaries it's my favorite thing to watch and that's what we would do and then we would you know mimic them and then do pranks and all that but we had a friendship group there which we felt safe in and we were encouraging each other to be more creative and more funny and you know my thing was i want to i don't really care about everyone else i'm trying to make my boy laugh in that i'm i'm, I'm in this scene with him i'm gonna make him crack up and if you ever want to people just do nothing shoot that's what it's like man. You feel that. You really so feel many that. we do so many there's so many outtakes which we're never allowed to show because we are so strict with the in character stuff we were you know, we never did any out of character interviews for years. Mm. We didn't want to break the illusion that these were not real people. But we, our, my, our goal was to make my friend crack up. If I can make him crack up, I know it's funny because I know he's hard to make. To, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? So it, it was that level of like safety, you know, being vulnerable around yeah, your yeah. friends. But what I'm hearing is like it started from a place of joy. Yeah, man. You know, like there, there was no kind of ulterior motive where it had to bang and immediately. No, it was just about like the love of creation. It was very pure. It was all about like you guys just making each other laugh. If anything, we felt uh, quite afraid of putting it out because we were all trying to be these serious rappers. Like, yo, check it. Like, you know, we were trying to be macho and that. And all of a sudden, you know, I've got these, you know, le leather shoes, you know, leather pants on and, you know, <laughs> leopard shirts looking like a freshie. You know, I didn't want, I was trying to get gal. You know, I mean, how am I going to get girl looking like some fresh <laughs> uncle? You know what I mean? So it was, you, you're putting yourself out there. So, so you know. when did it, so you guys. When did I start getting gal? Never. <laughs> Still waiting, bro. Hopefully this summer is, the, is it can't be a day. big summer one for day. me. I swear, this summer. You said that in 2004. <laughs> You've been saying that every year. Since anytime now. Anytime. Yeah. <laughs> um, when did it click for you guys where it was like, it stopped becoming a thing of joy mm. and it started becoming like really like, we need to do this because we are sick of what we do. 
Well, a long time, man. It's not, you know, people think that, oh, man, we got BBC came in and that was it. It wasn't that, bruv. It was but long, you, long, hard. You just put, you were putting work out on YouTube? Well, no, no. I mean, we put all the webisodes up and then we got a, a pilot commission. So these were like be- precursors to pre- people just do nothing. Yeah, they were like, yeah. they were like the beginnings of what they were. They were little was. pilots. That, the, the BBC didn't trust us at all. You know, we were first time writers, actors, never, no experience. They gave us a little 20 minute uh, pilot on BBC. Then they made us wait for a year and a half. We were working our jobs at nine to fives. I only quit my job, series three, what right before we won the BAFTA. I used to sorry. work in a, a, a like a... Um, we used to work call centers back in the day, but I used to work in a kind of TV studio thing, like a technical job. And it, it was like, we used to get the tapes and quality check them. I loved the job. It was a great job. And it got to a point, I swear to God, I used to work in Chiswick Business Park. It got to a point where I was actually quality controlling my own shows. So my own shows would be coming on and I'm watching my own shows for audio dropouts and glitches and everyone looking and going, is that you? Is that you? you know? yeah. So it got to a point where my agent, I love my agent, she told me, um, you take the risk. She was like, quit your job, do this full time. And I was like, Nah, because a job, and I was using all my holiday, I was grinding. I was using all my holiday to work, to film and write, working a nine to five. I was knackered, but I liked the security of a nine to five because you know what this industry is like, it's fickle as shit. You know, we didn't know, like I said, we didn't know. We had a pilot, year and a half, they made us wait. Then they gave a serious one, only four episodes. Yeah, that was like, I mean, I actually remember it was like something like eight grand for the whole year. For a whole year, eight grand, you can't live on that. You're on TV. That's you know, I mean, it's BBC Three back in the day. They have no fucking money, you know? Series two, five episodes. And then by series three, they finally gave us six episodes and it was like a normal job then. It was like, okay, I can make a wage off that. You know, then we won the BAFTA on series three. So it, it was not, people think like the come up's just a quick come up. It's not. And I, you guys know, it's it's never so, it's never straightforward so like nice. that. It's hustling. So man. it wasn't something you were initially excited about because of how slow and difficult no, it was? No, it was so much anxiety around it. It was like, you know, you're out there as well, but you're kind of like, and we never really popped. You know, if you think of our show, it's still a cult show. It's not in between us. It's not like peep show. It's mm. not, do you know, what I mean? it never, and I'm in a way I'm happy because I feel like I have a level of fame that's comfortable. Like where I do get recognized, but it's not like I can't live my life. You know what I mean? Like, and, and also like when people come up to me, especially white people, I like to do this and they come up to me and they go, oh my God. I was just chatting to my mate. Are you, are you, are you Chibuddy G? And I'll go, now, what are you trying to say? That we all look the same. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so sorry. No, I was like, chill out, white boy, it is me. <laughs> so it's a like level of fame, which is comfortable and content. I'm content with it. And that kind of phase is finished now. We're moving on to different things. And um, so, yeah, man, it, it was a long, long journey. And like, like you know, man, you, you put the work in and it's, uh, you know, and but like it, when it's done, it's done though. You just move on. Like I was talking about, you know, I don't watch the episodes. I like, I like to talk about them and the process because I think it's important to know people to know the journey and people to know that it wasn't as easy, but also super attainable, super doable. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think what you said as well, finding that group is very, it helps a lot. You know, coming from an ensemble, it helps a lot because doing it on your own is hard. Yeah, maybe it wouldn't have happened. No. Like so much of creativity happens when it's bouncing off one another. Like, like how much can happen in isolation or in a vacuum, right? 100%. Which is again, like why like, bringing like people who are like minded together is so key mm-hmm. but um no nah, i'm big up man like it's been an amazing amazing venue and the, the vibes have been appreciate immaculate you. and everyone yeah. seems so lovely you know so big up you guys as well yeah, man. hopefully like it seriously it's no, really no, I, I, I wish more of this is around no, like, and i could see this being a thing like you know you just know instantly when you're like the hopefully, vibes thanks, are man. it appreciate feels like that. this could be a, a big thing I so no big up are you trying to close out the night you got somewhere to be no 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 I need a shit. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I don't. I don't. The food was lovely. Sure. It was straight through me. Well, one I'm thing joking. I did want to say is um... that was a joke. <laughs> I'm actually constipated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as we bring this towards an end, one thing I wanted to do circle back to your parents because, like, of yeah. course, all our parents and family are formative to all of our creative journeys. Was uh, through this moment? Are they? Um, when did you feel like? Firstly, did were they like? encouraged by you kind of hustling through this period were they or were they kind of just like you know weren't really involved i'll be honest with you oh, sorry go on. and then what i want to know is like when did it stop being like some crazy awesome thing when did it start becoming like oh my son got a freaking bafta when did they start being proud of you for like- it wasn't the bafta 100 percent, because I, I tell you my mom is a like proper kind of ealing you know like she's a brilliant woman she's doing her master's in neuroscience she's an amazing yeah. woman but she's still quite ghetto like you know ealing council yeah. state and then she went to me, obviously super proud of the bath and she was going 
Yeah, it's not an Oscar though, is it? <laughs> no, she did it. Fucking say that. hell, mom. That's, I mean, that's what she's like though. You know what I mean? So like funny. she used to like on our birthdays. You know, she used to go. She goes, like, "What are you celebrating? It's just another year closer to your death." <laughs> all right mom she's funny as well so it would be like <laughs> yeah, kind of yeah. you know tongue in cheek but I, I, i'll be honest with you that the moment we got it uh the moment we actually got proper proper felt like i made it uh was when i got that special card from nando's you got the black card is it an actual real thing it keeps me, like, it's a real moment. thing and that was i swear to god that was the moment where my family looked at me like awesome no way Wait, hey, my dad would card? just call me up on a saturday <laughs> hello son <laughs> yeah what are you doing? <laughs> That's nothing, Dad. What's going? I was thinking we go Nando's. I was like, yeah, I bet you were bloody thinking that. Is it because it's Nando's or because it's free? Because it's free, of, of course. Because it's free. Dad, I know. You would rinse it as well, <laughs> like two hundred pound chicken bill. No way. You rinsing it. Unlimited. It. Every time? Rinsing it. No, no. There's not. You can't. You can't take the piss. Oh. And we don't even have it anymore. Like our time's up now. We're washed now. We had it for five years, and now they like we had it for, yeah, we had got a lot of free chicken. But that was the moment. I saw, I know it sounds weird, but. It is a thing though, isn't it? It's Massively. like a sta it's status, no, no, it's status. People think it. it's a symbol, 100%. you know, and that was on my dad. And my dad was, you're not supposed to really tell people, but now we don't have any more, it doesn't That's matter. So but um, my dad would go to, ev my dad would literally go up to people in restaurants and cafes and go up to them and go, do you know my son, Chabadi G? And then he's there going, yeah, you're right, yeah. He's like, Nando's black card. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, and he just pop off. <laughs> Oh, I, mean, I, I mean, that's the thing. That's why I said my dad won't embarrass me ever, because I'll be cracking up when he says that. It's funny, you know what I mean? He's a funny guy, man. Um, and as we come towards like drawing this to a close, do you feel like the arson that you were growing up hustling, doing shit just because like you had love for it, is different to the arson today? And if so, how? Yeah, I, I always have that. I go back to that kind of burning desire in me. Like I've done, you know, I've done a lot of things I'm proud of in my career, like. But I, I am kind of transitioning now um, to other things, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm doing movies now, I'm writing movies. I'm writing my first horror film with for BBC Films, which I'm going to be start, uh, start shooting next year. It's actually about gins. It's a very cool, scary film. Um, it's about... Uh, I had this idea. I mean, I give, you, I give you a little bit of a, you know, exclusive! So I'm DJ Khaled again. Um, <laughs> It's basically, I always wondered what happens to the families of terrorists? I always wondered that, like, what, where did they, what happens to them? How do they reintegrate, re reintegrate, re reintegrate, integrate back into society, you know? So I kind of had an idea of something with that and it's kind of set in Luton and it's about this man who did some bad stuff and his family coming back and then this gin, um, mm. you know, reappearing in one of the family members. And mm. But it's all like about, you know, because we can talk, not this episode, maybe another time, but about, you know, gins and mental health, right? And that blurred line of where he's like, there's a gin in her. No, sh she's not well. Mm. You know what I mean? It, culturally, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, yeah, they're no, trying yeah. to get the exorcist. They need to get the therapist. Mm. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I, I really want to do this horror film, basically, which has got social commentary and do a bit of a Jordan Peele. And I'm writing a sitcom with Chris Morris as well for the last few years, who did Four Lions. And it's kind of a reverse Four Lions where I play, uh, I play like an EDL member. Mm. <laughs> and it's a, like a satirical thing that I've been doing. So yeah, I, I do feel, I still have that desire because I'm doing very different things now. But I, I will always be Chibuddy G. I will always, I will never retire that character. I will always do stuff with him. Are you, pr are you proud of yourself? Yeah, I am, yeah, I am proud of myself, but I'm not content at all. Like, I still feel like I have a lot. And you know when, I mean, we know, we have friends, mutual friends who are doing, you know, ridiculous things. You look at Riz and you look at all these people like that and you're like, man, if Riz, and I say this to Riz, man, if you can do it, we can do it. And that's what he's doing it for. You know, he does it for that. And, you know, people, when we look up to those kind of people and they're doing all these amazing things, it makes it feel real, man. You know, like if you, you have to see it to be it, right? So yes, I'm proud. I'm proud of me. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of all you guys. I'm proud of us, but it's not enough, bro. Like we got a long way to go. 100%. Long way, you know? So you look back at your early life and I have to say, actually, there's not many people I actually think who are as consistent in character and drive as you. I think a lot of people go through a lot more fluctuations, but you've been consistently killing it. Thank but you, also brother. passionate, but also like in terms of what you stand for. But like when people ask you now, you know, outside of Chibadi G, outside of the characters you've played or the, the music the music you've produced, like who are you? Like what is the kind of, who is the Chibadi G you want to be known or the awesome child you've me as you want to be known as? I think, you know what? I just want to be known as like a boy from Hounslow. 
who likes who likes to create stuff and make people laugh, make people smile. I think you know for all whatever talents I have, I have a natural gift to make people laugh and make people happy. And I think again, I talk about my therapist a lot. My therapist said that what you used to do as a child is because of the, your parents fighting and the kind of uncertain nature of your childhood. You know the ups and downs and all this going on and. You know, you you were using your comedy to cheer people up, cheer your parents up when they were laughing, when they were arguing, or when your mum was down, and or when your dad was down and out and needing money or hustling, or people are after him. You were using your comedy to make people bring people up. And to this day, the best the best best comments I get, and when people come up to me, is when they say, "Bro, I was having a shit time. I was depressed, suicidal, and I put your shit on, and I'll just escape and laugh." Mm. And that that's everything. Like that is. That is the reason that I can be a clown mm. and make myself look stupid and laugh and be a twat. Mm. Because if it just changes one person's life or possibly saves someone in a dark place, bruv, like that's what I want to be known for. You know, just mm. someone who can make people smile. And to end, like you being a South South Asian Hounslow boy with certain unique obstacles and challenges that would have been particular to you, what advice would you give to your younger self or other creators who are in similar spaces as you to consider? or maybe to learn and grow from your experience? I think take the risk, you know, like a, a big part of comedy and not just comedy, anything in life is, you know, that thought in your head, that idea in your head where you kind of thinking, should I say it? No, I don't want to say it. I'm going to look like a dickhead. No, I'm going to be judged. Just say it because that's what's going to, a lot of people are thinking it, but the brave people say it and do it, right? So just say it and just do it and just, you know, believe in to back yourself, you know, because what's the worst thing that can, that little risk, man, you could be a legend. You could also flop. You know, if a little joke comes in your head and I try it, you know, it could flop, it could die hard. But also, I could be a legend. That one moment, I could own the room. And that feeling is forever. You know, you'll remember that forever. So just take the risk. You're a lovable, chubby guy, that's why. So you get away with it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Austin, awesome. thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you, brother. I think I, everyone in agreement that you are entertaining, you are lovable, you are all the things that you just said. Girthy. Girthy. Cute little fat boy. But having you here and bless this as the debut and like the first one means so much to me. It's an honor. Thank you for having me. And, fellas, uh, yeah. Really appreciate you being here. And if we can get a loving, loud round of applause for us and everybody. <laughs> Woo! My guy. Yeah. Smashed it.